um, the nature of my job um, is I go in and out of organizations, different sectors, day in, day out. I get to work in the charity sector, private sector, and the public sector. And it's a real privilege to be able to talk to those people and hear what their challenges are. And I notice that often people say to me that they're being asked to do substantially more with significantly less. Less time, less people, less patience, less tolerance, less give, less appreciation. And that's tough. It's tough for everyone. And I say to those experienced, hard-working, and um, well-meaning professionals who really want to do their best, invest those resources that you do have well. Invest them in embracing your energizing strengths. Em embrace those things that you can't resist doing, that you really enjoy, that you're attracted to, that you don't have to be taught because you learn so easily. Embrace your energizing strengths. And as leaders, enable your team members to do the same, to embrace theirs. In our 59 minutes together this morning, I want to take you through a, a pretty pacey tour of the strengths approach. I want to explain what I mean by it. I'd love, if you're up for some audience participation, to give you the opportunity to identify your energizing strengths. And also, I'd like to offer a little bit of evidence um, that grounds this approach and that demonstrates it does work. I know it sounds cheesy. I understand it sounds cheesy to say it does work. Um, uh, but from the bottom of my heart, I want to say to you that with 19 years of working for myself and five years of really focusing on this strengths approach, it does work. Uh, and when people are embracing their strengths, and they get that idea, they get that notion, yes, I will do that, it does work for me, they begin to make changes. Some of those changes are small, some of them are big, but for the individual concerned, they're meaningful. They really have an impact on their day-to-day -day lives. And because leaders are impactful people, what they do and don't do, where they focus, where they don't focus, has an impact on their teams. And I find that when I'm working with individuals talking about their strengths, they want to do the same thing, almost give the same gift to their team members too. And that inevitably has an impact on the organization. Just a bit of an aside, um, I was working, I was introduced in fact to a client a few months ago, uh, and he, if there is such a thing as a natural born leader, he's it. Uh, he's very highly regarded, upwards, downwards, and I've met his direct reports. They really think highly of him. And yet, when I met him earlier in the year, he said to me, I don't think I can do this anymore. And this was a, a real risk for him, for his team, and for the organization. He was, even though he was such a high potential individual, he was at risk of derailing. Of, of, of not having meeting that huge potential future that he had. And so we agreed that we give it a shot. We try and identify what his energizing strengths were, and we'd build a plan for how he could have his work life revolve around them, how he could use much more of his energizing strengths and much less of those things that he didn't think he was good at. And, just as importantly, much less of those things that weren't really him. You will already know that what I'm going to say now is that as a result of doing that, he's, he's much more back on track now. What he said to me actually was, I've remembered why I love this job. I've remembered why I came into this job in the first place. He's, he's refocused, he's revitalized, he's back on track. And even, you may think this is just, I'm saying this because... I'm up here, but even as I say those words to you now, I have a sense of relief in me, because for him to derail would have been an awful. And I don't know if any of you have read Susan Scott's Fierce Conversations, but she talks about leaders' emotional wake. Um, wherever you go, 
you're leaving a wake behind you. And you get to choose what sort of wake you leave behind you. And the strengths approach encourages you to leave behind waves and ripples of positivity, appreciation, authenticity, the real you. So before I get ahead of myself, there's a few little domestic practical things I want to talk about. You haven't got slides in front of you, but they are on the website. Um, and I, I hope that you'll be minded to have a look for those later. There is going to be, as I say, some audience participation. Having seen Emma and Chris and the man from the back, Kang Kang last night, I'm, I'm hopeful that you'll be willing to do the two exercises that I want to invite you to do this morning. They're brief, but I want you to go away with something that's very personal to you. And this, I think, will, these two exercises will give you an opportunity to go away with something that's meaningful. Um, and there will be time for some questions, I hope, at the end, if I keep to time. Uh, so if you do have questions, please remember them. I do want to hear them. Uh, and we'll get a mic to you uh, about 10 to 10. If we run out of questions, I'll give you my contact details. And I'll, I will be genuinely delighted to hear any further questions from you afterwards. So those are the practicalities. And if any of you are thinking, I wish you'd just get on with it, we're just going to get on with it. And I'm going to start with a, a definition. There are a number of definitions. I like this one because I work with Paul Brewerton and James Brooke. And some of you will have seen that you've got a quite pretty little slide in front of you with a wheel on it. That happens to be their psychometric that they developed to identify people's strengths. And their definition of strengths, you'll see, includes this idea that we look for things that energize us, that we find irresistible, have things that lead to our personal growth, because we don't have to be taught them. We want to learn them. When we're in an area of passion and energizing strength, we don't need teachers. What we need are facilitators. People are going to point us in the right direction, but actually, we're very highly motivated to learn ourselves when we're in an area of energizing strength. And when those things come together well, they're associated with us being at our best. Peak performance. And there are times, aren't there, when we struggle with things. And there are times when we're firing on all cylinders. So this is the moment already that we've come to for a little bit of audience participation. What I'd like to ask you to do in a moment, please, is to find somebody close to you. Um, move around if you need to. Find somebody uh, close to you. And I'd like you to talk about you at your best. Think of a time when even you, even you, thought, hmm, I did all right there. Actually, I was at my best. So I'm afraid everything is pretty pasty. It's all squeezed. I don't think I've done it in two minutes before, or four minutes before. But I'd like you, please, to find somebody and talk about a time when you were at your best. And when you're in the listening mode, when the other person's speaking, please, I, I think you guys are probably very skilled listeners. Use all of your listening skills, all the body language, the, what's not being said. Look for the energy as well. So this is our exercise, please. And I'm going to shout out when it's two minutes and ask you to turn to your partner. Please go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, your time is up. Can I ask you please to uh, draw that conversation to a close? I'm so sorry that it's so short this morning and uh, I would have loved to have given you more time to do that. And also, generally when I do this exercise, I invite people from the audience to tell me what was that like for you. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to assume this morning uh, that uh, your experience might have been similar uh, to other groups, whereby pe once people get over that initial, uh, I'm not sure I've got any stories to share of me at my best, then people tend to get into the groove and be quite energised by sharing and remembering and reliving that story of when even they thought they were at their best. Can I see if there's vague nodding? Was that sort of your experience? 
Uh, yes, OK. Um, that's probably the best I can hope for this time in the morning. Um, so uh, I share that with you because I would like to invite you to take that, that idea, that notion, back to your workplaces, back to where you are leading really quite big numbers of people. Use this approach in your one-to-ones and your teams, especially if you're noticing that people seem quite in the mode of, oh, I'm not really sure I can do this anymore. Because my experience is, day in and day out, with all sorts of groups, is that people really get something from remembering where they've perhaps made a difference, where they've made an impact, where they've been playing to their strengths. So try it, try it. What's different about the strengths approach? And I know you've heard lots of approaches at various times, not least at some of these events. The, the strengths approach invites us to look at both our strengths and our weaknesses. And because we seem to be hardwired to focus on our weaknesses, there's, we try to put real emphasis on the strengths so that we get that balance right. And that is the reality. Lots of people will say, oh, it's all very well to have a strengths approach. But the reality is I've got to address these weaknesses. And my response is the reality is that you have both strengths and weaknesses. And you will be considerably more effective if you focus on your strengths and what energizes you. And I'll come to the evidence of that later. So we don't deny that people have weaknesses. In fact, in a minute, you'll see there's quite a, there's quite a model around weaknesses. But what we want to focus on is also what strengths, what strengthens people. And the strengths approach also accepts that people don't change very much. This idea that um, we possibly get from our parents and schools and our workplaces that we need to be rounded individuals doesn't sit well with the strengths approach. In fact, we want to encourage you to be less rounded and more you, more you-shaped. And I know that doesn't always fit well with organisational cultures, and yet I still say, if you want to be really effective, if you want to play to your best, embrace the essential you. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in a minute to, to try and do that. Third uh, tenant behind the strengths approach is it assumes that people achieve differently, and that's okay. And that as leaders, our job is actually to agree what the output's going to be and to facilitate and enable people to achieve that in their own way. Now, of course, you can't just step back and abdicate what, and allow them to do whatever they like. But the, the emphasis is on output. And then let's use your strengths to marshal resources so that we achieve that output, but in a way that really plays to your, your passion and your strengths and your interests. And the evidence shows that it produces better results. The sorts of figures that we hear about are about 20% more productive. We are 20% more productive when we're playing to our strengths. We're six times more engaged. We're 50% more creative. And if um, I'll, I'll point you later to the evidence that demonstrates that. I won't be able to do all of it today. So it's about a balance of weakness and strengths. Personality doesn't change that much. Don't look for roundedness. Look for what's you. Look for balance. I'm going to start um, on the pink side, the purpley pink side. Uh, and you'll notice that um, what we've got here on the right, on the pink side, is the, what we call performance risks. On the left here is the strength side. And you'll notice that I've... I'm now using the word performance risks because that's how I see weaknesses. And I think actually it's very effective when we can to use the term performance risks rather than weaknesses because actually limiting weaknesses is only one part of what might be constituted as performance risks. So I'm going to start in the middle with limiting weaknesses. What do I mean by weaknesses? I mean those things that you're never going to be good at. I'm sorry to tell you this, but the chances are that if you, however hard you might try to get really good at your weaknesses, I very much doubt that you will ever be good at them. You might, though, choose to be just good enough. That might just mean a change of 3, 4, 5% that you get better at those weaknesses. 
Uh, but the chances are you will never get really good at them. They're not for you. You might instead set up certain systems to allow you to not fall into too many holes as a result of those weaknesses. But the important thing is that you focus instead um, on knowing what your, what your um, strengths are and being able to choose strengths that will counterbalance those weaknesses. So one of the things that I'm not good at is detail, uh, which could account for the fact that I completely forgot to mention before last night that I'm a vegetarian. So last night's menu was a bit of a challenge for me. So I, I'm not good at detail, uh, but, it's, um, but it is something that with systems I can overcome. So know what your limiting weaknesses are, but don't expect to become really good at them. And instead, try to use your strengths instead. Strengths in overdrive is another example of performance risk, and it's perhaps less familiar than weaknesses. And that's the notion that in amongst our strengths, we have one or two or three that we use too much, too often. A bit like that notion that um, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. We just keep banging away at that, using that same strength. And as a result, we get unintended negative consequences. Unintended negative consequences. And a good, a good, good um, early warning sign that that's happening is when you're a bit perplexed. Why isn't this working when I'm doing what I'm really good at? It usually works. It's because you're using it too much. And so part of getting this balance right is to know which of your strengths you're using too much so that you can dial it back, use a different strength instead. Probably one of those strengths that is a little bit underused and that you need to develop. The final one, and uh, I've had a few conversations with people about this last one, is interference. Is, uh, and one of the examples is the imposter syndrome. Uh, I don't know if you're, any of you are familiar with the imposter syndrome, but it's the idea that how, whatever level you've reached... You're just waiting for somebody to say, we found you out. This job wasn't for you. We thought we were recruiting the other one. So imposter syndrome is a real thing, and it's out there, and it, it's mainly in our heads. And when we know what our strengths in overdrive, our limiting weaknesses, and our interferences might be, we can do something about them. But do remember, please do remember, this figure. Research has shown that when we try really hard to get good at these things, we improve by an average of 6%. 6%. So it might be really important to just go that 6%, but don't put all your efforts into that. Instead, put a lot of effort into really engaging with your strengths and stretching your strengths. Think of what your strengths are, those things that energise you, you find irresistible, and then find new opportunities to use them. And when we can optimise those productive habits, those things that genuinely work for us, we find, research shows, that we become much more resilient, much more confident, much more successful, and much more engaged. Gallup shares the figure with us of six times more engaged. We're six times more engaged when we're doing what we do best every day. So, a bit more audience participation. I'd like you to turn over, you know, they've got that lovely wheel on one side, on the other are a list of 24 strengths. And I'd like you, please, just to spend two minutes, as intuitively as you can, picking out the five or seven that really seem like they're you at your best. I don't want you to think about what you're good at, please. I'd like you to think about where your energy is, where your passion is, where you can't resist doing things. And then, when you've identified your five or seven, turn to somebody close to you and tell them why you've picked those. And I'm going to give you two minutes to choose, five minutes to share, and five minutes to listen. And I'll give you time, time uh, mentions in the middle. Are we okay with this? Any questions before I start the timer? Okay. No, turn over on the other side. Got uh, 24 listed strengths. Yeah. Pick out your five or seven, that five, six, seven that speak to you, and then tell your colleague why, and then listen to them. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry, our time is up.
you could draw that conversation to a close, please. I'm sorry it was such a short time for you, and I hope you managed to get something out of taking the opportunity to identify your five, six, or seven energizing strengths. Um, and I hope that when you leave here, you, you will take some of that away with you and take the opportunity to perhaps discuss it with some other people. Are these my energizing strengths? Is th what, what's the feedback uh, that you can offer me? And, and to share with people, actually, this is how I see myself. This is when I'm me at my best. I'm not suggesting any of this is really easy stuff to do, but it is stuff that will allow you to stay true to yourself and be, um, live your potential. I just wanted to also point out that when I do this exercise, I often um, use these strengths cards um, and a bit easier probably to use than that sheet of paper. And when you're thinking about um, what you might do with your teams, feel, feel that you can go and engage with them on this topic. Ask them, show them that piece of paper and say to them, what are you energised by? And I would ask you to turn down this idea, it's what you're good at. So it's not necessarily what you're good at. Sometimes those things that we're good at are things we have to work really hard at. They drain us. We'd be quite happy to never do them again. So invite people to talk about what they're passionate about, what they find irresistible, what never makes it onto their to-do list because they've already done it. Now, we are um, quickly moving on, I'm afraid, to uh, just wanted to make reference to the fact that although I generally start the strengths journey in the development piece of an employee life cycle, that's the upside down one on the left, I use the strengths approach across the entire employee life cycle. I love recruiting via strengths. And our focus when we're recruiting via strengths, um, so we're not recruiting via competencies, we're recruiting via energy and passion. We're not looking for experience, we're looking for passion and irresistibility. We're looking for people, not, we're not looking for people who can do the job. We're not looking for people who can do the job. We're looking for people who can't resist it. They love it. Just let me, let me at it. Those are the people we're looking for. Um, so we use uh, strengths for recruitment, for selection, for onboarding, I used to call in, induction, for getting people in those first 90 to 100 days to really engage with the community, with their boss, with their role, with their team members, that onboarding for development, so for appraisals, uh, for um, uh, all sorts of talent management, uh, succession planning, and for, sorry about the phrase, but offboarding, when we're saying goodbye to people. Um, and of course, when we're saying goodbye to people, especially if it's um, in a redundancy situation, for instance, we're often focusing on why were you selected, which is usually about what you're not good at. And the strengths approach urges you to actually embrace these are the things, aren't they? These are the things that energise you. And think about how you could use those in another role and really, and really fly. So we use the strengths approach across the whole employee life cycle. Okay. So what's the evidence? Um, there are two slides on this. Employee engagement is one of those terms that we use, but it's very difficult to define. And yet we know the difference between an engaged person and a disengaged person. And that's really as much as I'm going to say on that definition today. But when we use the strengths approach, and we see this very regularly, employee engagement shifts hugely. Now it just so happens that the figure that comes out in a particular piece of research is from 9 to 73 percent, and in the next slide you'll see it's moved 12 percent in six months. For me, the figures are detail, uh, and they're less interesting to me. Uh, the fact, what I love is to be working with people whose eyes are bright and shining, who are actively wanting to know what comes next, who are bringing people with them. That, for me, is much more important than 9 to 73%. 73% engagement is pretty impressive. This um, next piece of evidence, supporting people to use strengths, can result in 38% higher productivity. And again, detail, don't remember these. This comes from a piece of work that was done with 300,000 employees across 51 companies. And they found that when people are being supported and encouraged to use their strengths, they get 38% higher productivity and 44% higher employee retention. Because we like hanging out in places where our strengths are appreciated and encouraged, don't we? 
The, the final one, I, if you remember no other figures today, I'd really ask you to remember this one. And first of all, I'd like you to think about when you last were in an appraisal discussion. Either you were the, on the receiving end of the appraisal or you were the person running the appraisal. And think about when you, where you spent most of the time, where you focused your attention. Because, again, detail, nearly 20,000 employees, this is a piece of research, meta-research, across 20,000 employees, 34 organisations, 29 countries, and they found that where the focus in an appraisal was on strengths, they saw a 36% improvement in that person's uh, productivity and performance. 36% improvement when they're focusing on strengths. When the focus was on that person's weaknesses, they saw a 27% decline in their performance. A 27% decline. Now, I'm guessing that any of us who've been in an appraisal where the, the focus is on weaknesses, we didn't anticipate, we didn't want them to get 27% worse in their performance. But that is what this piece of research is showing us. People get worse when we focus on weaknesses. So when you're next in an appraisal, please spend at least equal time talking about that person at their best and what their strengths are and a little bit of time also talking about what their weaknesses are. This is a piece of work, a project which was all embracing about uh, the strengths. We were able to do work across the whole employee life cycle and lots of numbers here. 79% improved confidence in their strengths. What does that mean? That means that four out of five people were able to say, this is what I want you to come to me for. This is what I want more of. I want to be, sorry about this phraseology, I want to be your go-to guy for this. Ask me to do more of this. 66%, 66%, two-thirds of people improved their contribution. They were able to say, I've, I've done this, this, and this, more than I would have done previously. 77% were able to do that yin and yang thing that you saw earlier on, able to focus on their strengths, but also not ignore their weaknesses and do that little bit of being good enough in those things. 66% removed or reduced the limiting weaknesses. Now, chances are mainly it was reduced rather than removed, but 66% still impressive. And 73% improved their overall performance and results. And as a result, the engagement levels increased by 12% over a six-month period. And, and, and after huh, 30 years in uh, sort of the people arenas of organisations, um, I can't think of anything else where I could honestly stand up here and say you can expect to see 12% engagement improvements in about a six month period. So I love this stuff and I, and I hope that um, as a result of our conversation today that you might, want to, um, you might want to learn a little bit more about the strengths movement because we have definitely just uh, scratched the surface today. Um, you may be pleased to know that after I've sat down at four minutes past ten, uh, you won't ever hear from me again, unless you want to. And if you want to, um, the, my contact details are on the bottom. You don't even need to interact with me. I have a website that's got all sorts of resources on it. I blog twice a month on all strengthy things, uh, and I tweet strengths at work is my Twitter handle, uh, and I share all this wonderful stuff that these strengths people, these people uh, put out there, all these researchers do. If you um, want to sign up for my blog and receive it, you can do that on the website, or you can text free, it doesn't cost you anything, the word strengths with your first name and your email address to that number if you think you're going to get back meaning to do it, but not going to do it. It's all free. And these, these guys, Martin Seligman, Tom Rath, Barbara Fredrickson, are fantastic people to watch on TED Talks to, and to read their books. Uh, just uh, search uh, on Google and you will find some amazing resources there. And I'd love to hear from you. You'll have my email address at the bottom. If you've got any questions that we don't answer today, um, or you don't think of them today, then please do email me. Okay. I think we have now reached the time where it might be okay to open the floor to some questions. Um, so we have some mics, I think, somewhere. If you have some questions, we have about 15 minutes, and I'd love to hear them. Any questions?
Hello, Rachel Farrell from Hampshire. Hello. Um, how does the strengths work in teams? Because obviously, if, if you find yourself in a team where everybody's got similar strengths and nobody's passionate about being creative or innovative, then um, you might, might have a few problems. So how does it work, yeah. matching teams? Yeah. Sometimes that happens. Um, and the first thing I'd say to you is, uh, don't make any assumptions about what people's strengths might or might not be, because we tend to think of strengths as those things we do really well. And uh, we might even imagine that we know what those person's strengths are. This is a different game. This is asking people to look inside themselves and decide what they are really passionate about. So first things, don't make any assumptions, because it, it never ceases to amaze me when I ask people to pick these cards out, what their strengths are, because they can be so different to what I might have been anticipating given the role that they're in. So don't anticipate. Second thing is, if you genuinely look at a situation and think, aha, uh -huh, OK, nobody's really passionate about that, then the important thing is to recognise we're going to have to do it anyway. That's, this isn't about being uh, looking at life through rose-tinted glasses. We're going to have to do it. But there'll be, usually, I've found when I'm working with teams, there's somebody who, um, for, who, for whom it's OK to do it. They'll put their hand up and say, well, I'll do it. It's a bit of a stretch for me. Please note that I'm a bit drained by it. Don't ask me to do loads of it, but I will do some of it. So, first of all, don't make any assumptions. And then my experience is that in teams, there are usually people who will do it and recognise that it's draining for them. The third thing I'd say is, and this happens all the time, is people say, OK, we have got a hole here. Let's recognise it and be honest about it. And when we have the opportunity to recruit, we'll go out and recruit for somebody who's passionate about that activity that nobody else here is passionate about. So those are usually my three responses when that situation occurs. How, did that answer your question? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, so morning, Chris Moon from Surrey. Um, my chief, Lynn Owen, spoke to us yesterday and uh, her top tip was don't focus on the self, uh, put aside your aspirations and uh, focus on the service we're giving to the public. Okay. Um, are there any tips you'd like to give, Lynn? <laughs> oh, okay. That was I've... quite career-limiting, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing that with me, though, because that's, that's really important for reasons I'll perhaps share with you later. Um, I, leadership is personal. That leadership wake that I made reference to, it's personal, and it's there whether we like it or not. Y you and I are giving off vibes wherever we go, and um, I think it's really important if you want to uh, give the best possible service, and I get the sense that you do, um, to the public and also to those people that you work with, then I would say you need to make sure that you are embracing your strengths and that you're using them every day, and that you're developing them. And you're acknowledging your weaknesses, but you're developing your strengths. One figure I forgot to mention, by the way, you know I said that if you focus on weaknesses and you want to get really good at them, you might improve by only an average of 6%. When you focus on really stretching your strengths and getting really good at those, the research shows that you will improve by an average of 48%. 48%. Because you don't, remember, you don't need to be taught. You're already self-motivated. So I think if you want to give the best service, you need to start with yourself and you need to embrace your strengths and get really good at them. And you need to enable your um, direct reports and maybe your peers and maybe even your boss to do the same. Did that answer your question? I just wonder, would that anybody recruit to put on shadow? Thanks for sharing that with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Anybody else need the mic? Okay. Tony Dawson uh, from the Met. I can hear you, I can't see you. Could you please I'm at the wave back, at me? sorry. Um, how do you reconcile this with 360 feedback? Okay. Because I find that useful, but, what it, but if I get, if I do 360 properly, then I get a list of normally more weaknesses and strengths. <laughs> and the people who've done it have got an expectation I'll address those weaknesses. Mm. Mm. Well, the good news is that the strength scope tool that you've got one page of, it's about 14 pages long, there's an, a part of it that's 360. 
So you fill in your seven, you fill in, answer all the questions, and it says, ah, oh, these seem to be your seven energizing strengths. Is that true? And then it shares it with eight people. And it says, I ask those people, are these this person's energizing strengths? And do you see them? Do you want to see more or less of them? And it, I think it's a fun, it, it, it's really impactful stuff. So I'm a big fan of 360. Uh, and I, I, I really think it's a good leadership tool. Um, for me, though, I have uh, spent too many uh, hours with clients who are distressed by their 360 feedback because, unfortunately, um, the, the, the people do take this opportunity to focus on weaknesses. And I think it is incumbent upon leaders to say, actually... Uh, this isn't a very productive way to be. Remember that figure that I said to you in, in appraisals? If we focus on weaknesses, performance falls by 27% on average. So the, the impact that 360 has, uh, I've never tested it actually, if it's all focused on weaknesses, must be off the scale, I should think. That's been my experience. With the Strength Scope 360, it's all about tell me. Are you seeing these things? Do you want to see more or less of them? When am, I, uh, when am I at my most effective? How could I be even more effective? It's very much focused on that 48% figure, but it's not ignoring the 6% figure. So it gives you the opportunity to say, OK, if there's a, is there a really critical derailing weakness that I need to address? It's, you get the opportunity to do that in this tool, but the focus is very much on the 48%. How, what can I strengthen? How can I maximise my performance? So my view is 360, tick, love it, but the context needs to be on the 48%, and not on the 6%, or less on the 6%. To, was it Tony? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm struggling. Uh, to what degree did that answer your question? Half, okay. because it's it answered, I think, in respect of using 360 within your framework. Yeah. But if we're in organisations that have used 360 feedback, which focuses very much on what should this person do more of and do differently, um, so we've bought into that approach, how do you then integrate this when people doing it are going to be writing probably quite critical comments? Mm. Yeah. I think it's in the setup. I think it's up to us, you guys, to really get out that message of the 27% versus the 36%, the minus 27, the plus 36. It says, if I'm to be at my best, um, I need to know what your feedback on when I'm at my best, when you experience me at my best. I could stand down here, sorry. Um, when, when am I using my strengths and what are my strengths? And to couch it in those terms. And for those of you who, I don't know how your system works, so I apologise for this hole in my knowledge, but when somebody's discussing this 360 feedback with you, the focus has to be on the good stuff. I really want to hear when I'm at my best, where my strengths are really playing out themselves out well, and to play down the weaknesses, because it's just not productive to focus on the weaknesses that much. So I, I, don't, I don't know enough about your systems to perhaps be able to respond in the way that I'd like, but I would like to ask each of you to take on board those figures and to do whatever you can in the moment, in your one-to-ones, in your teams, but also in your conversations with yourself to focus on me at my best and my energising strengths and me when I'm at my most productive and engaging. I don't know. Did I, did I move Absolutely. from half? Absolutely. Thank you very much. To, okay. I think he was being kind there. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Hello. Hello. I'm Joanna Young. Um, I'm not sure in the police service we always embrace difference as much as we should. Okay. And so sometimes someone may have a real passion and a real talent for something, a real strength in something that perhaps doesn't fit the cultural norm. Yes. And they end up either leaving or being mm. deeply unhappy. So how do we, or what would you suggest we as leaders, as managers, um, do to help those people um, thrive rather than what I see sometimes is suffocate? Mm. So how do we help them to thrive and what can we do to help embrace difference and help them to get along, really? Mm. Thank you for that question, because actually I, I haven't touched on that, but it is... 
Um, it is one of the benefits of the strengths approach is greater diversity because the strengths approach is, is less about experience uh, and less about competencies and it's much more about passion um, and as a result I hardly dare mention the name Aviva after last night um, but Aviva are the poster child in the UK uh, for the strengths movement they have really invested in this approach and um, a piece of work that they did was that they went out to recruit 50 people. And I have to smile a little bit because the punchline may not land quite as well given what happened last night. Um, but um, they went out to recruit 50 people and they decided to do it via the strengths approach. And they, so they went out to, to the world and said, we need people who are really energised by X, Y and Z. And they'd identified that through really looking at their best people. And they got a different uh, type of pe person applying. They got a much broader range. Insurance is a quite conservative um, um, industry. And uh, they ended up recruiting 40 out of their 50 people. And many of them had <gasps> tattoos and uh, unusual hairstyles and came from different ethnic minorities. They, they didn't fit the normal conservative image. Uh, and the punchline here is that as a result of gathering together 40 people who were different, um, they never actually had to recruit the remaining t 10 people because those people were so productive, so productive. And we might say, of course, when we ring them, I wish we recruited the other 10, uh, but it, they, we are much more productive. And as a result, that's because we're playing to the entire population and not just a segment of population that's a bit like us. And um, with the strengths, we're encouraged to look at what people can do and love doing and can't resist doing. It's much more enabling for people. And um, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me, but this is purely anecdotal, that the strengths world is populated by a really diverse population. I think it, it, it encourages people to be themselves and to expose their talents. So that's sort of the intro. What I would say to you is that I, I, think, it's, I think it's down to all of us, actually, um, to remember that experience is important, competencies are important, but actually people's passion and energy is hugely more important. And you will get people who are alive. Remember I talked about that client who... Um, he just said, I can't do this anymore. When I see him, saw him week before last, he's so much more alive because he's himself. He was trying to be somebody different, being himself. So I think it's down to you, please, to go out there and embrace people's strengths. And that starts with you. You have got to live and breathe your energising strengths. You've got to tell people that it's okay to just to be you and to, to live to your strengths. Uh, and you want to know what they are. Tell me some good stories. You could go into a meeting tomorrow and you could say to your one-to-one -one or your team or whatever, tell me, what's, um, when have you been at your best this week? They will be a bit surprised, but they'll soon get it. You got it. What do you think you're energised by? What are you really passionate about? Start those conversations and keep having those conversations and have those conversations upwards as well sideways and with your direct reports. Tell your, tell your bosses, just want to tell you, I want to be your go-to guy for this. This is what I love. Give me more of it. And by the way, give me less of that. He's really good at that. To what degree have I answered your question? Thank you. Are there any more questions? I have no idea what the time is, I'm sorry. Have we got time? Yes, thank you. Um, hello, it's Sean Wilson from the, uh, uh, from the Met. Um, I see a lot of very highly energised people. At some point, they go for burnout. Yes. Uh, and I find one of the failings within uh, the, any organisation, certainly within us, uh, within policing, is managing that passion, mm. managing that high energy, because a lot of them are very talented as well, and two things happen. Often they'll come into conflict with equally capable but less energised individual, mm. right. which is part of a contributory factor. Uh, and the second piece is, of course, they themselves have uh, not really got the work-life balance necessarily addressed. Yes. 
What is your best um, recommendation for assisting us as managers in managing those individuals and mm. I suppose managing it within ourselves to keep those energy levels going? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, my best advice would be, two little bits actually, one would be make sure that they really are their energising strengths, that they're exuding all over the place. Um, because very often people who have enthusiasm as a strength uh, they may actually be wanting to be enthusiastic around learned behaviours. Those things that they're really good at, people keep telling them they're really good at, um, but uh, they drain them. I'm noticing that a red light has come up, which means I've come to the end of my time. Okay, so I, I would check, first of all, are they really their energising strengths, or are they the things that uh, people keep telling them they're good at, and therefore... They're draining themselves and wearing themselves out. Uh, and that's a conversation, I think. The second thing is that uh, when they come into contact with... What, was it about work-life balance? Was that right? Then I would, again would come back to the context. People who are... If they're playing to their strengths, it can be a bit lonely sometimes because there aren't lots of people who are around them playing to their strengths. And I think I would encourage you as leaders to... Go back and create the environment, create the vocabulary and the language of strengths and appreciation and me at my best. And you'll make, once you start doing that, you create a community that speaks in the same way, there'll be much more places for those people to go and feel at home. Uh, because f a sense of belonging is really important in this. I'm conscious of the time. If I haven't answered your question enough, I'm very happy to try again. But just, may I just say thank you so much for all your attention, your audience participation. I really enjoyed last night, I really enjoyed today, and I really hope that you will go away and embrace your energising strengths and enable your people to energise theirs. Thank you very much. I wish you well. Thank you.